morning. Welcome to worship. Uh, That's a little gloomy today, but there's one thing about the Margate Community Church. It is always full with God's love, and so it is great to see all of you here. Just a reminder to sign the little friendship registers and then pass them along so we know with whom we are worshiping. Excuse me. Um, Thank you to everybody who helped with the Mardi Gras party, dinner party, on Friday night. We had a wonderful time. Betty, for so much help with everything that she did for us. Rob set up speakers. Joe Clark gave us some real Creole music, uh, food. We had fun. The king was supposed to wear this today. Um, Guess who? Richard. (laughs) Um, However, our little doggy is sick, and he has her at an animal hospital this morning. So uh, the king couldn't wear his crown, but trust me, he wants it home. So... And it's not going home. That's okay. But anyway, we had a wonderful time. We're going to try it again next year, and I hope that this time we'll have a few more people. But it was so much fun. So thank you all for making it possible. Today, of course, is Super Bowl Sunday. We're all aware of that. If you happen to remember some soup, we will collect it after church, and we will make sure that it goes to Grace's Food Pantry in Summers Point. Um, the bullet, oh, today after church, we have a wonderful celebration for Valentine's Day. There are some special goodies that Betty has arranged and set up for us in Fellowship Hall. So please make a point of coming to, to coffee hour so that you can enjoy that. Um, the bulletins were printed before Carmela's vacation, and she didn't get it right about the trustee meeting on Tuesday night. There isn't one. So trustees, we meet on the third Tuesday, so skip that announcement this week. There is no trustee meeting on Tuesday. However, Wednesday is a pretty big day. We're having bell choir at 6 o'clock. We will end a little early and then have a service for Ash Wednesday in Fellowship Hall. We will be around tables, and we will have a communion service. I also will have ashes available if you would like imposition of ashes after the service. And then following that, the chancel choir is going to go over a piece or two uh, for rehearsal. So there's a lot of things happening. But the service for um, uh, Ash Wednesday starts at 7 p.m. Also, on Thursday morning, 8 o'clock, is the men's breakfast. If you have yet to come to one, please come. It's early, I know. But we have great discussions and a wonderful group of guys that come. So please Just come in the side door on Thurlow Avenue. And now let us begin worship by listening to the intro. Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship printed in your bulletin. God is waiting for us. God is ready for us. God is blessing us. God is sending us. God is here. Let us worship God. And now we'll sing the opening hymn, 154, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name, verses 1, 4, and 6.
We'll now say the prayer together. Wondrous worker of wonders, we praise you, not just for what has been or for what is, but for what is yet to be. We praise you for being gracious and loving beyond our comprehension. We praise you that out of the turbulence of our lives, a kingdom is coming, is being shaped out of the slivers of our loving, our bits of trusting, and our sprigs of hoping. Awaken in us the gratitude for our lives, the love for every living thing, the joy of what in us is human and holy. Grant us prayers in our hearts, trust in your love, and a song for our journeys. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And now I'd like to invite the kids to come forward. Good to see everybody. Hey. Lily and Leah, Gabriel, Abby, Cash. Good to see everybody. You know, we come to church to learn about Jesus. And what's one of the main things we learn from Jesus? What? Love, yeah. And isn't it appropriate that we're coming up to Valentine's Day, and so when Jesus puts love in our hearts, we're supposed to share that love. We're supposed to give it away. And that's one of the cute things about Valentine's Day, right? We give out Valentine's, sometimes little gifts to people that we love. Well, today, I have Valentine's for each of you. And since we can't keep the love to ourselves and it needs to be given out, I want you to grab a bunch of Valentines and I want you to pass out the love to our congregation. Can you get it out of the basket? Just take a bunch. That's it. Pass it out. Pass it around. I'll take the basket. Hey, don't forget the choir. <laughs> they need all the love they can get. <laughs> there you go. Here's some more. Okay. Good job. We never run out of love, but we ran out of Valentine's. <laughs> oh, there's more in Fellowship Hall, so if you get to coffee hour, you'll be sure to get one there. Okay, you guys can go to Sunday school. Thank you. Thank you for the help and spreading the love. And now please join me in the affirmation of faith in your bulletin. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. Do not put your trust in mortals. Princes, presidents, and celebrities cannot help you. We put our hope in God. Our help comes from the one who endures forever. God cares about the hungry and the oppressed. God wants your hands to be free and blood on you. The Lord protects strangers, takes the side of orphans and widows, and loves those who seek to live justly. This is the God we love and serve. Thank you, Sonia. As we come to our time of prayer, I'd like to remind you of some of the concerns of our family of faith. We're continuing prayers for Dave McCann, Ken Heck, Cynthia Mario, Neil Gamble, Lexi and her family, Fran, Carolyn, Athena, Carl, Don Green, Joanne DeJohn's friend Joanne, Carol Zerby's brother, Bob and Ken, Sonia's niece, Roxanne, and her daughter, Nora, Dylan, Maria, Catherine, 
Gerald, Dana, Carl Ekstrom at home, Linda Donovan's mother, Gladys, Ginny Beck's friend, Kathy, and we're also praying for Nancy Young, who had knee surgery and is doing very, very well. So we give thanks for answered prayer. Are there any other joys or concerns to share? Yes. Okay, a friend of Howard's at a blind camp. Okay, thank you. Lynn? Oh, okay. Lynn's stepdaughter, Pat. Jimmy? Sheila, okay. We're praying for Sheila. All right, let's join our hearts and minds in prayer. Let us pray. God, you are our refuge and our strength. We gather gratefully as brothers and sisters in Christ, made in your image, called to proclaim the good news of your love. You have come to us in Christ Jesus as our Redeemer and the giver of new life. You send us the Holy Spirit to guide us with counsel and might. You have commissioned us as your people and empowered us by your grace. We thank you, God, for your hope that bursts upon us. We thank you, God, for wisdom that enables to see how all the fragments of life come together to make us whole. We thank you for faith that steadies us when we feel buffeted by the currents of life. We thank you for the love that overcomes all hurt and fear. This morning, Lord, we pray for our world. We pray especially for the leaders of our country and other nations as well. Give to them a sense of humility amid the power they exercise and endow them with respect for each other so that all your children can dwell in peace. We pray for individual needs, O oh God. We remind you of all those we have mentioned before this prayer time that are in special need. Grant each your power and strength and wisdom, your healing touch, and your comforting arms. Meet each precious person at the point of their need and help us to see ways in which we can be your hands and arms for those petitions. We pray for this church. May it continue to be a light to this community and the world as it has for nearly 95 years. May all members of this church family work together in this place where the good news is proclaimed and lived. We pray all these things in the strong and powerful name of Jesus, who taught us all to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In honor of the Super Bowl, the ushers will receive your tithes, your gifts, your offerings. Okay.
Let us pray. Dear God, you have been so generous with us, with your love and care and gifts. And so, Lord, this morning we return a portion of those gifts to you, that your love may leave this place and that we may love each other. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Our scripture passage this morning comes from Mark's gospel. Uh, There are lots of places in the New Testament gospels where Jesus is having discussions, let's say. I don't want to say arguments, but discussions with the religious leaders. Jesus often taught in the temple, and he taught with real authority, of course. He was God. He could do that. And he understood the scriptures And the people were amazed at the way he knew so much about them. He was a rabbi, yes, but he was um, amazing with his knowledge. And you know, very often, as soon as you think you know something, somebody has to come up and argue with you about it. And the religious leaders did that. They just wanted to prove how smart they were, too. And so when it says on the first line of the scripture passage, one of the teachers was listening to the debate. That's what they're talking about. And they were talking about nonsense, like, Jesus, do you think we should pay taxes? Jesus, if a man's wife dies and he remarries, who's going to be his wife after the resurrection? Who cares? And this is the kind of discussion that the um, scribe, so to speak, was listening to when he talked to Jesus. So listen for God's word to you this morning. One of the teachers of religious law was standing there listening to the debate. He realized that Jesus had answered well. So he asked, of all the commandments, which is the most important? Jesus replied, the most important commandment is this. Listen, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And I'm sorry, I'm going to read it the way it's printed here. The Lord our God is the one and only Lord And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. The teacher of the religious law replied, Well said, teacher. You have spoken the truth by saying there is only one God and no other. And I know it is important to love him with all my heart and all my understanding and all my strength and to love my neighbor as myself. This is more important than to offer all the burnt offerings and sacrifices required in the law. Realizing how much this man understood, Jesus said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, as I already mentioned, today is Super Bowl Sunday. So, of course, our subject today is football and commandments. Guess how I'm going to tie that together, okay? After all, there are a lot of rules and commandments in football. And if you're like a guy named Bill Cower, former head coach of the Pittsburgh Steelers, you want to abide by these rules. That's what he meant when he said, We don't want to circumcise the rules or anything. Oh, come on. (laughs) Football has so many rules that seriously, I don't think that all the players, the coaches, the referees, everybody knows every rule there is. And that's why football players uh, sometimes can appear a little dumb. 
there was a guy from the Cowboys who once said that former Steeler quarterback Terry Bradshaw, who, by the way, has four Super Bowl rings and is a TV analyst for football, he said that Terry couldn't spell cat if you spotted him a C and an A. That's pretty dumb. When all of us, or some of us, turn on the TV tonight, I want you to watch for something very old there on the field in the middle of all the high-tech hoopla. I believe football is actually one of the most advanced, technologically advanced, rather, sports events. You've got to understand that the offensive coordinator is sending plays into the quarterback's helmet. There are overhead cameras. There's super slow motion plays. They challenge calls by the refs. A computer-generated graphic puts a yellow line down the field so you know exactly how many yards they still need for a first down. It's just amazing what they've done, but there is still something that is very old out there on the field. It's old school. It's determining where the ball is to be placed and if it has gotten far enough to make it down. And if you know about this, you know there are two six-foot sticks with a long chain in the middle of it. And that happened all the way back in 1906. That has not changed in all those years. That was the year the NCAA determined that a team needs 10 yards, not five, for a first down and the year that a legal pass was formalized. Can you imagine a football game without passing? I can't. Spalding's official football guide of 1907 set down the rules, and that has lasted all these years. It said to assist in measuring the progress of the ball, it is desirable to have two poles six feet in height connected at their lower ends with a stout cord or chain 10 yards in length. Thus, the chain gang was born. Now, since then, every football game, from peewee to pros, a group of officials stand on the sidelines with those six-foot poles and those their blaze orange, usually, and that 10-yard cord chain between them. One end is placed, hopefully, where the football ended up, which, by the way, is pretty arbitrary considering that an official has to eyeball it from as far away as 25 yards. It doesn't sound too exact to me. And the other end of the chain marks the line that you want to get to, 10 yards away. When the play ends, the on-field official estimates the spot where the ball fell, and he marks that with his foot, tosses it to another official, and that's the place where the ball starts. When the new spot is close to that first down end, that's when the chain gang comes out. They bring those poles and just to see if that ball has made it over that chain to see if they get four more chances to run the ball. Sometimes this is one of the most dramatic moments in the game. Sometimes the drive continues by an inch. Sometimes it comes up just a chain link short. And I know a lot of tradition is associated with the chains. The measurement can swing the momentum of a whole game as much as a long pass or a tush push can. But because the chains are set purely on the basis of the eyeball of the official, the margin for human error is pretty big. There must be a better way, says Pat Summerall, because games are decided, even careers are decided on those measurements. Now you'd think with all the technological advances that we all have, GPSs and lasers, it would be a no-brainer to figure out just where that ball lands in the pile of big, sweaty men. But they don't even have a computer chip in the ball. They, they could even paint some kind of a line for the audience, but they don't do that 
for the football players on the field. Surely they should figure out a better way to measure it on the turf. Well, no, at least not yet. For years, inventors have tried to come up with alternatives to the old chain gang. Since 1929, people have been inventing and patenting things to make it more exact. Even lasers have been tried, but they don't use it. It stays with the old chain. Sometimes the old school way of measuring, whether it's on the football game or the game of life, is important. In our scripture passage, as I mentioned, Jesus found himself in an argument with some religious referees. Jesus is asked for, about the criteria for measuring the progress in a person's life. And for his answer, he reaches back to an ancient rule book. One of the scribes that I mentioned hears this argument going on, and he sees that Jesus is holding his own against the self-appointed committee. Up until this point, as I mentioned, it's all bickering about silly things, paying taxes, who will be married to whom after the resurrection. The religious leaders want Jesus to give them some really high scores on their religious intelligence. But it seems that Jesus might be playing by a different set of rules. So the scribe figures out that Jesus must be the author of the game. And he asks Jesus what the number one rule is. What commandment is the most important? And in response, Jesus breaks out the old measuring stick. Reaching back to Deuteronomy, he says, the greatest commandment is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Now this text, called the Shema, is still used this day in every single synagogue service, every Friday night, every Saturday morning if there's a service. And it's also supposed to be the prayer that you say early in the morning when you wake up, and the last prayer you say at night when you go to bed. So the starting point for everything, says Jesus, is worship. Worship is essential to recognize who God is and also because it sets the agenda of who we're supposed to be. If we're made in God's image, as Genesis tells us, then we'll find our true position and purpose in life only when we learn to love and worship the one whom we're designed to reflect. When the players are on the football field, now think about this, they have to focus all their attention on that snap of the ball. They have their minds all on running the play correctly. They have their strength in blocking and tackling, and all their hearts are on winning. On every play, if those chains get moved. The same is true for us if we want to make progress if we're going to grow into the image of God's beloved children. And then because we're on God's team, we're to participate with God in moving the world toward the ultimate goal line, God's kingdom. Worshiping God isn't just a head trip or about coming up with more technological gadgets on Sunday to fill up the stands, I mean fill the pews. So first down, our first priority is always focused on worship. And the scribe only asked for the first commandment, but Jesus added the other end of the chain. He said, this will help move humanity toward God's kingdom. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. If we get, begin with worship, loving God with our whole selves then we also make progress, chain link by chain link, toward the next stick, which is loving our neighbors. In the stadium, you know your team is doing well when it, they can constantly move the chains and get toward the end zone. 
At the end of the day, usually it's the team with the most first downs that wins the game, mostly. But if we're following Jesus, our success is measured not only by how God's love transforms us, but by how that love finds its way through us to other people. Time and again, Jesus coached his disciples by saying that their love for God would be measured by how much love they showed to others, particularly people in need. Remember, Jesus said, when you do things for the least of the population, you're doing it for me. The scribe understood that old school wisdom that Jesus was teaching, and Jesus blessed him for it. He said, you are not far from the kingdom of God. In other words, you're not far from the end zone, the place of victory. You know, I think this is a great Sunday to evaluate where we are, both individually and as a church family. Are we honestly worshiping God with our whole lives, with all our hearts, souls, minds, and strength? Are we worshiping God with what we value most? Usually that's time and money. In our church, are we doing all that we possibly can and finding creative ways to help others? If Jesus were to break out the sticks this morning, where would we be? First in goal or fourth in a mile? Will you pray with me? Oh, Lord, today might be a day of fun and games, but help us to take the time to evaluate how much we're putting into the game called life, honoring you and taking care of others the way you ask us to do. May we sincerely find out whether we're first and goal and close to your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our last hymn is number 127, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah, verses 1 and 2. I hope you'll join us for our little Valentine treat in Fellowship Hall after service. And I also hope you'll join us on Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock as we begin our journey through the season of Lent to get to the goal of a joyous Easter. And now may the peace which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of God's Son, Jesus Christ. 
And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and with those whom you love today and forever. Amen. Thank you.